In this, this short video, we are going to introduce the concept of the determinant. Now, what do we know about the determinant? Well, surely you have seen this formula for the 2 by 2 determinant, or the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. Um, and we certainly seen this AD minus CB in the formula for the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, there's other ways that you can write the determinant besides just writing DET. Uh, you could use these absolute value signs around uh, the uh, letter representing the matrix. Or you could just go ahead and use these absolute value signs and then just write the entries of the matrix between them. So it looks like a matrix, but since there's no, these are absolute value or straight lines rather than uh, brackets or parentheses, then it is a determinant. Uh, the determinant is deep. Uh, you could spend an entire mathematical career studying the determinant in its many forms. But we're going to just barely touch the surface for, for our use here. And uh, But one important connection we can make right away to the topics that we've discussed before is the connection to invertibility. A square matrix is invertible if and only if it has a non-zero determinant. If the determinant is zero, then you know right away that the matrix is not invertible. Uh, and probably somewhere in some other course, you may not remember them, but you must have seen formulas or uh, some sort of memory aid to help you calculate uh, determinants, at least for the 2x2 two two and the 3x3 three three case. And if you had any half-decent algebra class, or maybe even a pre-calc class, you may have learned some of the properties of determinants. So what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to develop these formulas, but we're going to use some mathematical techniques that will help us understand uh, and prove some of the essential properties of determinants. So before we go too deep into the algebra, let's look at some geometric interpretations. If we look at the uh, parallelogram. So if we look at our our square matrices, and I'm looking at the 2 by 2 case, having two column vectors. So we're really looking at, so we have our matrix A, which has two columns, A C and B, D. So we're going to take the first column vector, A, C, the second column, B, D. U is going to be called A, C, and V is B, D. So the uh, green vector here, and this is another copy on the other side of the parallelogram. That's the vector U. And then the blue vector here, which has another copy across from it, parallel to it, uh, that is our vector v. Uh, we're going to call the angle between u and v as theta. And you can see that they determine a parallelogram. And we're going to call the height of the parallelogram h. So what we'd like to know is what's the connection between the determinant of our matrix A and the area of this parallelogram. So what can I say? Well, area is just base times height. So the base would be the length of the green vector, the length of U times H. And then from triangle trigonometry, the length of the vector V here would be the hypotenuse of this right triangle. And so h I could write as the length of v times sine theta. So if we want to 
go through this strictly from an algebraic or analytic point of view, we can uh, use the following facts. We've already used the sine theta as being opposite over hypotenuse to rewrite the height as length of v sine theta. We're going to make use of the Pythagorean identity, so sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared theta. Uh, we'll use the angle formula for cosine theta involving the dot product. And we'll use the fact that if you take a number and square it, and then take the radical of it, remember radical means positive square root, you take the positive square root of x squared, you don't get x, you get the absolute value of x. If you know x is positive, then an absolute value of x is x. But in our case, we won't know if what we're taking the positive square root of was originally a positive number. All right. So what do we know then? Uh, if I just go back and we said that the area is the length of u times the length of v times sine of theta, then if I square both sides, then the square of the area would be the length of u squared times the length of v squared sine squared theta. And this is where I'm going to use the Pythagorean identity, replace sine squared theta with 1 minus cosine squared theta. And then I'm going to replace cosine theta with the dot product formula. So then I'll have u dot v squared over length of u squared length of v squared. Now I'm just going to go ahead and use the distributive property and multiply through the parentheses. And so then I'll just get length u squared times length v squared minus the dot product of u and v squared. Let's go ahead and put in the components then for u and v. Remember u is what ac and v is bd. So I'll have ac dotted with bd. The length of ac would just be uh, a length of AC squared would be A squared plus C squared, and the length of V squared then would be B squared plus D squared. So let me go ahead and use FOIL in this first term, and then form the dot product in the second term. That still needs to be squared, so let's go ahead and square that out using FOIL. And now let's collect some like terms. I have an A squared B squared. I'm subtracting an A squared B squared. I have a c squared d squared, and I'm subtracting c squared d squared. So I'll be left with three terms, a squared d squared minus 2ad bc plus b squared c squared. And that is actually the square of a binomial. It is the square of quantity ad minus bc, and that's our area squared. So if I want to get the area, I can take square roots of both sides, but remember that when I take the uh, positive square root of the radical uh, of uh, a number squared, I just get the absolute value. So the area then is going to be the absolute value of the quantity AD minus BC. Or you could say that the area, if I took uh, both square roots, would be plus or minus AD minus BC. And so Really, we can think of the determinant as the area uh, of the parallelogram um, with a sign. And we're going to discuss why we, or how we can determine what the sign is geometrically. Um, and then uh, we can also reinforce the theorem that we said that a matrix A is invertible if and only if its determinant is not zero. Uh, if it's not invertible, then the columns have to be linearly dependent. And in, since there's only two of them, that would mean that they would have to be parallel. And then you have no area, right? The, uh, you don't really, you have a degenerate parallelogram, which has no area, or the area is zero. Now let's look at that same proof pictorially or graphically. So here I have essentially the same parallelogram. I have my 
vector u, it's red this time, and my vector v, which is blue. And again, I got copies of u's here, and here's another copy of u. This is another copy of v. And uh, what I'd like to do is relate the area contained in that parallelogram with the determinant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this white rectangle, which is just AD. And all I've done is taking the vector U, I've projected it onto the x-axis. I took the vector V, projected it onto the y-axis. That's how I got my A and D. And I'd like to see, well, how does the area of this rectangle relate to the area of the parallelogram? Well, let me go ahead and break this rectangle up into uh, five parts. So this was my white rectangle that I had before. Now I have broken it up into five pieces. And I can see that I can actually fill up the rectangle using the pieces of the and fill up the parallelogram, excuse me, using the pieces from the rectangle. And in fact, I don't even need to use all of the pieces. If I take a copy of piece number two, I can fill up this part. Piece number one is entirely contained in the parallelogram. And then I just need a copy of piece number three. And now I have filled up the parallelogram. So the parallelogram is just the area of pieces one, two, and three combined, which means that the original rectangle, the AD, is too big in order to connect that to the area of the parallelogram. I have to take AD and then subtract the area of piece 4 and piece 5. Now, what about piece 4 and piece 5? Well, if I make a copy of those and put them together, they are going to form a rectangle whose base is the quantity b and height is quantity c. Well, that is the same b and the c. So b, in fact, if you think about b, b is the projection of v onto the x-axis, and c is the projection of u onto the y-axis. And so now I've got my formula for the determinant. The area of the parallelogram is AD minus BC. And in fact, that AD minus BC is, can be written in terms of projections. It's the projection of the vector U on the x-axis times the projection of the vector V on the y-axis. Subtract off the projection of V onto the x-axis times the projection of U onto the y-axis. Well, what about the sign? Um, well, it really depends on the uh, angle between u and v. And the way to state it is that if you can take your vector u, so your first column vector, rotate it through an angle of theta, a positive angle which is less than 180 degrees, and have it lie on top of V, uh, then your determinant is going to be positive. On the other hand, if uh, you could say that the, if you just always go clockwise, you have to go through more than 180 degrees. Or if you, you could say to go from U to V, to rotate U to lie on V, you have to go through an angle which would be counterclockwise, or smaller than 180 degrees, then your uh, determinant value will be negative. All right, in higher dimensions, well, in three by three, we can still think of things in uh, three dimensions, the analog of a uh, parallelogram is called a parallelopiped, and it looks kind of like a squish box. 
uh, depending upon the, the angles between the vectors, uh, the column vectors of A. And it's actually the uh, signed volume of that parallel of pipette uh, which represents the determinant. And again, we can reinforce our notion about invertibility and the determinant because if you have uh, column vectors which are linearly dependent, then they lie in the same plane, which means that uh, the parallel of pipette is, uh, has no height to it and its volume would be zero. And in even higher dimensions, um, the object determined by those n column vectors is called a parallelotope. And uh, the determinant represents the signed hypervolume of that parallelotope. Now let's look at these formulas. And we'll start with the formula for the 2 by 2 matrix and uh, see if we can just observe some pattern that uh, we could use to maybe get to eventually a general determinant formula. So starting with the two by two, we're going to relabel the entries according to their row and column numbers. And we're going to use two subscripts or indices. And uh, so the first subscript is going to tell you the row number and the second is the column number. So A12 is in the first row, second column. And then our formula would be, uh, for the determinant, would be A11 times A22 minus A12 times A21. And let's look at that carefully. Uh, the way that we've written it, uh, we have two terms. And that's just the formula that we were given. We've got two terms. And in each term, there are two factors. Remember, factors are multiplied together. Terms are added or subtracted. And so we have two factors. So in the first term, the first, the first factor is A11, and the second factor is A22. In the second term, the first factor is A12, and the second factor is A21. So when we talk about factors, we're talking about things that are being multiplied together. And they're written, in each case, in row ascending order, meaning that if we look at the first subscript, we're going to go in order. It's A11, A22, A12, A21. So we're always going to write our terms with the row indices from smallest to largest. And if you also think about it, um, in both of the terms, the factors come from two different columns. So in our first term, the first factor is from column one, and the second factor is from column two. In the second term, the first factor is from column two, and the second one is from column one. And in fact, you could also make the observation that uh, each factor comes from a different row as well, but of course, because they're in row ascending order. All right, uh, in the first term, the column numbers go in order or in ascending order. But in the second term, they're just looking at the column numbers, the column indices here they are going in descending order. And that's what we call an inversion, where the column number of one factor is larger than the column number of a factor to its right. Uh, and it's this inversion that leads to a negative coefficient. Every time you have a, a the idea is that every time you have an inversion, the coefficient changes sign from plus to minus or from minus to plus. So it always starts out with a, a plus, and then since there's an inversion, that's why we get a minus. We'll see that in more detail in a minute when we look at the three by three determinant. So 
If we take those same observations and apply them to a 3 by 3 matrix, or the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix, uh, what do we expect? Well, we're each uh, term, we, don't, we haven't found how many terms we're going to have, but each term is going to have three factors. And it's going to pull one of those factors from each column, different columns. And they'll be written in row ascending order. So uh, again, the row indices are always going to be 1, 2, 3. And then it's x, y, z that are going to be different column indices. Uh, and they'll all be different because they come from different columns. So in that term, the x, y, z uh, indices or subscripts there are going to be different numbers. They're going to be chosen from 1, 2, or 3, but uh, there's never going to be any repetition. So now, how many terms are we going to have? We know that each term has three factors in it. Well, for the first factor, so if we look at the way we're writing it for that x index, we, we can choose any one of the columns. It can be 1, 2, or 3. So let's go ahead and choose 2. If I choose 2, since I can't have any duplicates, I can only choose from the other ones, so 1 and 3, for my uh, column index in the second factor. So my y could be chosen from 1 or 3. So if I go ahead and choose uh, y to be 3, then I don't have a choice now for, for the last one. The last column index has to be the one that I haven't used, which would be 1. And so I just gave an example of first choosing 2, and then choosing uh, 3, and then the last one being 1. But I could have made any choice. And how many choices would we get? Well. A good way to, to look at it is in a tree. So the first level of the tree says, oh, you can choose the column index to be 1, 2, or 3. So in that first level of the tree, you have three choices. But once you've made a choice, if I choose 1, then I only have two choices left. I could choose 2 or 3. If I chose 2, then I could choose 1 or 3. And if I chose 3, I could choose 1 or 2. And then uh, once I've made my second choice, then the third choice is determined. And so this is a good way for us to list all of the possible choices. And I see that there's six of them. So my determinant is going to have um, six terms. Each term is going to have uh, three factors. And the only thing that's left to determine now is what is the coefficient? Is it plus 1 or minus 1? Do I have a plus sign in front of the term or a minus sign? And remember, that's related to what we called an inversion. Right? So remember that an inversion uh, is going to flip the sign. And an inversion is whenever you have a factor with a column index, and you can find another factor to its right with a column index which is smaller. So in the first term, um, the column indices are 1, 2, 3. So there's no inver inversions there. So that's going to remain plus. If I go to the second term, where I have 1, 3, 2, well, 2 is smaller than 3, so that's 1 inversion. And since it's 1 inversion, then the sign flips to be minus. In 2, 1, 3, again, the 1 is smaller than 2, and so that's 1 inversion, and the sign flips. Now, in when my column indices are 2, 3, 1, well, what, what do I have here? I have... Um, an inversion because 1 is smaller than 2, but 1 is also smaller than 3. 
So the first inversion flips it to B minus, but the second inversion flips it back to B plus. Same kind of thing happens with 3, 1, 2. And then with 3, 2, 1, I have 2 is smaller than 3, 1 is smaller than 3, 1 is smaller than 2, so there's actually three inversions. So it goes from plus to minus, back to plus, but then back to minus again. So I've got three terms with a plus and three terms with a minus, and that's how I have my formula now for the determinant. You can also look at these in the following uh, table, and uh, you can observe that, so here are the, uh, in the first row here, I have the terms represented that have a plus sign, and in the second row, the terms with a minus sign. And one thing that you can see easily from the table is that in each term, each factor comes from a different row and a different column. Uh, and uh, if you wanted to think about inversions, it's a little bit more complicated. You should really, you need to, because we're going in row ascending order, we have to go from top down. So you would say to yourself, oh, uh, for this particular, as I go from, uh, excuse me, um, if I go from the top down, look below, are there any uh, terms that are in the box that are to the left of this? And yes, so that would be one inversion. And now I go to the next row. Is there, are there any terms below that in a box which are to the left? Yes, so that would be two inversions, and that means that I still have a plus sign here. So it's, this, this table is probably not that useful to, to find inversions, but you can do it. Now, that formula, uh, no one expects you to have that memor memorized. Um, so there's several memory aids, and one we're going to learn right now, and that is the, that you take the first two columns, and by the way, I, I wrote it up there, and I need to really emphasize it. This only works for three by three matrices. If you try to, to use this same technique with a four by four, it'll fail. A five by five, it'll fail. It only works for three by three. So uh, what we do is we take a copy of the first two columns and append them. So now that we have five columns, and then we follow this pattern, which is really the same pattern in the two by two formula, if you think about it. As you go from the uh, top left, going along the main diagonal direction, uh, that gives you a term with a plus, so there's three of those then. And then if you go from the lower left to the top right, so the, what we call the anti-diagonal, if you go along the anti-diagonals, that product will give you the terms with a minus. So let's uh, work this out as an example. Using our memory aid, what will we do to find the determinant of this three by three matrix? Well, we'll go ahead and copy the first two columns. Now we've got five columns. And so what will I do? I will want to go along the main diagonal here. That'll give me my positives. And then if I go along the uh, anti-diagonal, that will give me my terms with a minus sign in front of them. And so that's what I have here, 0, 1, negative 6, that is from that diagonal, 2 times negative 3 times negative 9, and then negative 7 times 4 times 5. Those all have, I mean, they're going to form some product, which will be plus, minus, or 0, but then we put a plus sign in front of it, so we just keep the sign. Uh, and then along the anti-diagonals, 
So I'd have negative 9, 0, negative 7, 5, negative 3, 1, negative 6 times 4 times 2, and I have to put a minus sign. Work out all those signs carefully and add it up. It turns out to be negative 23. And um, so we're going to be looking at more general uh, formulas for uh, the determinant of an n by n matrix in a future video.